So I'm just going to go into a, a rough framing of um, the topic from today, uh, which is the blind spots of uh, decentralized organizations. So one element I, I can pinpoint in time where we started talking about this for me is the, the article from Joe Freeman called The Tyranny of Structurelessness. Uh, maybe someone can drop these reference in, in, the, in the chat for, for the others. Um, for me, in this article, Joe is really starting to explore this incoherence between the narrative that we communicate and what we actually uh, do and embody in our practices and daily actions. Um, then Frédéric Laloux came around 2014, something like this. Uh, that was like a huge wave for many people. Um, and then we had uh, Francesca sharing in 2017, uh, cut the bullshit, organizations without hierarchy do not exist. So um, here we are in 2021 and uh, it's, we're still struggling with this. I mean, let's face it. Uh, it's kind of hard to embody uh, this decentralization on a collective and personal level. And uh, we struggle between centralization, decentralization and individual and the collective. And this is really what we wanted to explore uh, with Francesca is about this tension between the, the collective and the individual and how can you combine individual needs with collective harmony. So we also, this also led to other questions like um, how to embody multiple political visions as a single organization or how to play with like implicit power dynamics and uh, collective and personal shadows. So we actually met the five of us on Monday and we went into some very cool explorations uh, among which I can share some here like the ideology of decentralization, um, conflict avoidance and how to integrate the green level and postmodernity, uh, value alignment and group coherence, uh, compassion, trauma, but also uh, how can we drop the maps and this whole, I'm more chill than you and hierarchies of level of consciousness. So we're gonna deep, uh, deep dive into all of this and I'm not gonna spoil more. And now I'm gonna hand it to you, friend. Thanks, Tim. So yeah, to kick us off, um, we were thinking we could dive into some stories. So I guess also to give everyone a bit of a chance to maybe add anything else about yourself that you think might be helpful for people to get to know you and sort of your, uh, I guess, perspective onto this topic. Um, I'm maybe gonna invite Lucia to kick us off, then James and then Rich to just each share a story. So either from your personal, like very personal experience or maybe from an organization or group you've been working with, what is a blind spot that you have seen um, that you would like to share with us? Mm -hmm. So basically a blind spot of decentralized organizing. Yeah, go ahead, Lithia. Thanks, Bran. Um, yeah, I was thinking about which one do I choose? And I guess I'll go with one that is both organizational collective and my own sometimes. And it's about how um, do we all carry and hold assumptions and stories that shape us shapes how we behave and sometimes shapes how we relate to each other because we are assuming that others share our same stories. And I guess one example of that is, or could be stories about money. One, one practice that we have quite integrated in Greater Than is after each project, we use an adaptation of um, the Happy Money Story game. And that's how we distribute funds at the end of the project or in the middle of the project. And we also started kind of uplifting, sorry, uncovering what I see, what are the stories that we're all carrying around money? And we did that through, we had a Telegram group and everyone was sharing their stories about money uh, from childhood to how we grew up, what has been our life experience around money and what has been shaping our stories around money and what are they at the moment? How are they affecting how we are, how we work, and how we behave and relate to each other? And, and I think that was amazing. That was really good to see, to see not only understand each other and see what stories we all carry, how different they are, 
but also to see how we do that as well in other aspects of life and work. And I guess even um, I'm seeing that at the moment in my personal life. I'm currently sharing a flat with my youngest sister who's 25. And we do have really different stories of what sharing a flat is <laughs> and how it looks like. So I guess you're yeah, looking at organization and putting an organization on a systemic level, I kind of always carry that question. What are the stories that I'm carrying? What are the assumptions that I'm making here? What are the stories that we share? And what are the stories that we actually don't share and probably need to understand better? So it's not about changing them, but at least understanding that we do have different experiences and perspectives and things might, be, might move differently for different individuals. And how can we, I guess, work with all that to create, um, you know, a collective space, I guess. Um, yeah, I think that says quite a bit about me as well. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I've got two stories, one from the past. Uh, they're both relating to me. Um, so when I was younger, I was quite entrepreneurial. And I was also quite traditional in my ideas around organizational development and management. Uh, so I was in a position of leadership, and I don't think I was the most enjoyable person to work with, actually. And what's interesting was systemically, I tended to attract people who had a profound disappreciation for constraints and boundaries, <laughs> and things like timekeeping and being concerned about quality of work and so on. And uh, so I experienced a few times until I woke up to what was happening, quite a strong polarization. So on the other side of that, then, is the intention, well, I'm going to do that differently. One, through awakening to uh, perhaps some of the dysfunction in the way I used to approach organization um, and, and not wishing to kind of repeat that. And secondly, just as the years pass by, recognizing the value and even necessity of decentralizing in some context. Um, and so then the, the blind spot that comes to mind for me is around keeping conscious the intent to kick off an organization with a kind of decentralized approach. Um, and so I made a couple of notes before the call reflecting on this, like a clear why is really important, but it's not enough. Um, and if you're, if you're a founder like I was, or, you know, you might, there might be many people coming together, but who really kicks this off? Who's really holding it? Who's initiating it or bringing the, the idea forward? And what are the minimal necessary constraints? Because the other side of the coin from being a totalitarian dictator is that there are inadequate constraints. And then there's un, that much unclarity that things become ineffective and quite often even the purpose of the organization is compromised and, and isn't really served so much or if at all. Um, so I had an experience like this quite recently, actually. Um, and so the, the final point that came to mind for me was around the question of who to collaborate with, because it's one thing to be open in the invitation and for people to come forward and collaborate but it's very important, especially with freedom comes responsibility or with rights come responsibilities as well. And so there's a number of criteria that need to be in place for people to step into that collaboration with me, with you, for them to really be prepared to go the distance and, and commit to whatever's required to move things forward together in the way that you would need. So, um, yeah, that was... Uh, you know, it doesn't matter, my, my experience is, it doesn't matter how much I know things, how much I understand the theory, even how many times I've gone through the process before. Those deeper habitual behaviors, those deeper identifications in me play out again and again on a spiral. And so continually coming back to that question, why am I motivated to do what I'm doing? What's the kind of agenda behind these behaviors is, in my experience, a, a, a always valuable thing to do. Very rich, James. I'm wondering, like, should we all take a, a brief breath together to just uh, digest what we heard and then we'll go on to Rich? We wanted to introduce some slowness. Go ahead, Rich. I don't know if you hear that storm in the background. Um, it was 30 degrees and 
completely clear skies about two hours ago and now it's like chaos out there. Um, I wanted to, in my story, um, set the big frame um, because I think it reveals some of my own assumptions which might have their own blind spots. So for me, the big frame is decentralized organization is not just um, one of many choices about how to organize. It's not like choosing if I wear a red shirt or a blue shirt. It's, it's um, for me, it's an expression of cultural evolution that there's a, there's a progressive destination for a more pro-social future, which is better for people and better for all the other creatures and the other life on the planet. Um, and I want us to go there. You know, I believe, I believe that humans can um, have wonderful capacities that we're not really exercising most of the time and, and that there are ways of organizing that bring those capacities out of us. So obviously that comes with its um, shadows of elitism and my own stories about who's doing it right and who's doing it wrong and all this sort of stuff, right? So there's, you can fill in your own details about what blind spots I've got there. Um, but when I, I honestly feel like I can feel it when, when the cultural evolution is underway. Like there's, a, there's maybe this kind of slow burn thing that's hard to feel, but there's these moments of intensity which are really clear to me. And just in a kind of um, lighthearted joking way, sometimes my friends will call it when, when the great vibe arrives. And sometimes you'll know like you're at a party and it's the start of the party and it's kind of like people are a little bit awkward and they haven't really landed yet. And then something happens. There's a transition moment where you've stopped being self-conscious and suddenly you're just at the party with all these people having a great time. And for me, that's when the great vibe has arrived. Um, and I have the same experience in, in collaborative groups that are more purpose oriented, not just relaxing together, but trying to do something together. There are these moments of cooperation and collective intelligence where uh, something, there's a switch that goes from who I was and being so concerned about me and, and what do I got to contribute and how do I look and all that thing to just participating in a collective organism. Um, and even now, as I'm describing, I can feel the, the hair stand, standing up on my arms again. It's like, yeah, that thing. <laughs> I know that thing. Um, it's a thing that, uh, yeah, that I have a huge amount of passion for. You know, it's, it's what I'm committed to is uh, inviting more people into that experience of participating in a really extraordinary super organism that's capable of meeting the challenges of our generation. Um, so all that to say, <laughs> I was working with a colleague, someone that I regard as you know one of the best in the world at um at this next stage of organizing someone who's got a huge amount of experience and, and talent and knowledge and practice um, and it was his job to host a, a new group they were coming together over three months to go through a learning journey a group of 20 people and my job was just to support him and be his kind of like be be, be at his back and rub his shoulders and things um, and that experience over, over the 12 weeks, the great vibe never arrived. <laughs> it never, it, it was like, we did the things that needed to be done. We, were, we went through all of the steps, but there was just no sense of that electricity of that chemistry of that magic. Um, and I was reflecting on why that was. And you know, this is so subjective. This is just all my story about what's happening, but this is the, this is the meaning that I'm making of that experience. Um, I think what was happening was that he is completely ready to lead in what I would call a teal way, meaning not the old hierarchy of domination and uh, you know, self-serving, controlling, um, coercing, but nor the totally egalitarian consensus building, bring everyone along every step of the way, but the teal thing, which I believe in, which is like, where you keep your autonomy and you're doing something in service of the group, where there's this like um, curious interplay between those two things. And I see him as being so ready to, to occupy that seat, but the group was not willing to put him there. The group was, was implicitly demanding for him to, to be in this green consensus mode. Um, and a bunch of us could see that happening. He could see it happening. He didn't want to be doing it, but it was like, um, the construction of this learning journey was more and more done by consensus. Uh, but it was just it had this kind of lack of authenticity because it was clear that he didn't want to be doing it that way. Um, and it clear in a, in a subtle implied way. 
Um, <laughs> so that, that really just reminds me of what you said in the prep conversation, Fran, on Monday, that a lot of us, you know, the tyranny of structurelessness was written 50 years ago. And it's a just exquisite documentation of something that has been understood for decades. And, and you've known about it, Fran, I've known about it. We've written our own versions of that article. And still, knowing this, uh, the lessons are not embodied. They're not integrated into our everyday practice, our everyday behavior. James was saying the same thing. But, um, so what is the obstacle between the theory and the practice? That's the big question for me. Um, and I'm hoping in the next you know, half an hour or something, we're gonna figure it out, please. Solve it. <laughs> yeah, if we do, that would be really great. <laughs> it's a big one to take on. So yeah, I guess I'm wondering, yeah, Tim, go ahead. No, go for it, I was about to say. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I don't wanna dive too deep into this right now, but yeah, I think this question of uh, how does leadership work in the context of being more a more decentralized or self-managed organization. Yeah, it's just a completely, uh, it feels like a very unknown territory still, like something that uh, many of us are really grappling with. So many different people that I meet that don't really, I guess, see the role models or yeah, have a good sense of what does it really feel like? Um, and I guess, yeah, just to, just to echo on what Rich said, I guess I'm wondering like, yeah, how, how could we learn more about what is holding us back from, from trying out these, these new types of leadership? And like, what are, what are our fears there? Because I definitely sense that there's, there's fear. And I guess if I think about some of the people I work with, like everyone has their bad experiences from, you know, maybe working in the corporate world or working in a huge bureaucracy and like the scars are quite big. Um, but what I find quite interesting is that, I mean, for instance, I'm someone who's never actually had that kind of experience. Like I've never worked in a, in a traditional company at all. I've only ever been in networks and communities. So if even I am having that struggle, uh, I must have just, you know, I don't know, learned it through my environment or it's so deeply rooted that um, it's really, really hard to actually figure out what it is. So yeah, I, I'm just curious maybe to just spend a few more minutes uh, on, on that thread and see if there's any other, yeah, questions or additions that you, the panel here has for us on this, this topic of, of leadership. Cool. Um, so on my side, maybe one story I can share is, um, I grew up in a, I'm like Fran, I never worked in a traditional environment, though my, where I'm coming from, my family is very traditional. And I kind of developed this archetype of the re rebel and being very anti-capitalism uh, and anti-hierarchy, anti-patriarchy, I mean, you name it. And um, I was a bit like James, quite entrepreneurial when I was young. And the first organization I started was a student organization um, to basically organize conferences and workshop and uh, the first conflict I had um, with a person where I actually realized that I was reproducing internally on, the, on my team what I was fighting uh, against, um, that was actually quite traumatizing. And till this day, I'm still working on developing the necessary self-compassion to actually uh, grasp kind of the full spectrum of, of that. Um, and maybe the second story to illustrate this is that I've been building like this, this whole system uh, to kind of detect uh, blind spots and shadow practices and misalignments. Uh, I shared it with Francesca and, and Rich and many people of, people of the WeShare community. And uh, in February, I wanted to launch it. Like, yeah, we're gonna uh, integrate all the shadows and we're gonna uh, find all the blind spots. But I realized that there was one crucial element missing and um, also within me, which is this capacity for self-compassion um, and actually um, relating to this gap between the theory and the practice in a way that it's not like blaming and shaming, but in a way that actually is caring and because you know that there's a growth potential there. So for me, it's all about how can we truly uh, relate differently with our incoherences Sorry, this is my French kicking. Um, and as James was saying, like this, 
I'm emotional ma in nature because I can uh, be aware of when I'm not. I think this is this is uh, really key. So um, I see multiple direction here. We can either go in the coherence direction, either go into the leadership direction. <laughs> But I think that uh, actually, James, I will have to leave a bit earlier. And I really want to deep dive uh, in, in this notion of experimenting around this common beat. And uh, yeah, I'm curious to know how um, to generate these kind of environments. And um, yeah, what you think about this, James? Well, firstly, I love that metaphor of the beat and then people with a lot of freedom to um, experiment and express themselves around that. Maybe there is a way to tie together your kind of inquiry, Francesca, a little bit towards why these why these situations are so difficult to get beyond somehow with the coherence topic as well. Uh, I can't be absolutely sure about that, but I'm going to try and do it briefly as well. So the story that I was reminded of that I've shared online before was when I used to work with teenagers and I worked with school excluders. So they were facing social exclusion because of behavior that was generally quite power orientated you know like impacting their environment and on the other side was the school phobics the kids who were afraid to go to school i think for some good reasons sometimes but historically many of them had been victims of power so this power vulnerability poll was really present in my work and and the, the point i want to make here is that you could have a conversation with a child that was identified with vulnerability as a survival strategy because by staying small they don't present themselves in a way that might be perceived as threatening and then crushed by somebody who's more able and willing to embrace power than them. And then on the other side are the kids who've disowned vulnerability because they experience such suffering and misery from others who exercise power against them and made a decision to never be vulnerable again. And it was so much easier to have a conversation with the school phobics around the potential of embracing power to influence and how that could serve them in their lives. Even though their struggle to do so was wrought with the need to face their vulnerability and wound. But to have a conversation with people identified with power about the merits and value of reconnecting with vulnerability was a much, much harder thing to do. And I'm saying that because I think that, you know, more or less, we've all kind of landed in a position somewhere on that pole in our lives. And some identify entirely with power and disown vulnerability, some more on the other side, and many of us are somewhere in between. But if we look at leadership as influence and power as the, the expression of our capacity to influence and vulnerability as our openness to be influenced, then it starts to shed a little bit of light on the dance of power and vulnerability in our organizational systems. And then let me see if I can tie that over to coherence somehow. So we spoke in the preparation about the difference between alignment and coherence. So a really clear why is important, not something fluffy and abstract and random and inspiring. I mean, fine if you want that, but why are you getting together? What are you, what value are you going to create? What's the purpose it serves for whom and in what way? Um, but beyond that, alignment is very difficult in complex environments, because if we're all going in the same direction, we can lose diversity. And as I said the other day, we can all be lemmings falling off the cliff one after the other. But to handle complexity, we need coherence, meaning adequate kind of, I guess if we come back to your metaphor there, Timothy is like, we've got a clear rhythm. We've got some basic kind of constraints around how we're going to play and express together. And there are some constraints that aren't to limit people other than to enable everybody to be able to play together, work together in a way that's um, uh, harmonious somehow. Um, and then the other point, let me see if I can get back to that a minute around power to influence. It, in complexity, you also need people to be free to be able to create value as much as possible for themselves. And so this question of leadership, everybody's a leader. Everybody needs to be a leader. And so how do we clarify those, those domains in which people are free to lead? How do we recognize when the limits to that autonomy are met? How do we then make sense of dependencies that lie between us and find ways to collaborate towards responding to those effectively in response, in a coherent way and in response to whatever that clear why is that we came together to collaborate around to start with? So. There's a lot there. 
I'm curious um, on the topic of how to create coherence in a group. Um, you shared some really interesting thoughts, Lucia, on Monday about presence. And I just wondered if you could maybe share a little bit about that. Yeah, thanks, Brian. That's funny because as James was talking, the same similar thoughts were coming up. And I guess I was just kind of reconnecting with the, the, the idea that we actually have to acknowledge that we need that central bit. And, you know, this allergy that we sometimes have to any kind of anything that looks like um, leadership <laughs> in the centralized organizations. And I think it does come from a mix or a paradox uh, between on one side is the trauma that is sometimes has been created by hierarchical organizations, social conditioning, or even family um, relationships and systems. And on the other hand, the fear of losing control. So how do we balance that? And we are kind of just dancing in between those two, wanting to do it, but not knowing how. And I think one of the, one of the I don't know, one of the things that comes to mind when I talk about that is the need to slow down. Um, we first understand concepts and ideas and even frameworks cognitively with our head, with our mind. And we uh, um, acquire the language and the concepts at a very cognitive level, but we need more time and to slow down to embody it. And I guess that comes with what you were just saying, Fran. We are now in the phase where we are creating safer spaces for, for people to say, share more, do more, have more autonomy. I think what's next, what we need now is to start creating um, ways for everyone to grow everyone's capacity to hold more. Because like, I come to a safe, we have a safer space here. I come and share more of myself. And everyone here does the same, which is great for me because my load, my own load is now carried by all of you. And it's same with yours. You come share more of your, your, your own self, your whole self, your trauma, your stories, everything and anything. And we all are carrying more, but we don't know yet. We haven't gone to the step of growing more capacity for everyone to grow more. So it can feel a little bit overwhelming. And I think growing that capacity and slowing down to actually allow for the concepts and the ideas to be embodied and go, doing it together by actually being intentional about that, you know, it's like, okay, great. Now we have a safer space. Everyone's adding the stuff on the table and now we all have to carry more and we don't really know how to do it. So I think the concept of embodiment and, and slowing down is so important. And I see so many teams and people wanting to do things differently, but still rushing. And it's like, that's not gonna happen. It's like, we cannot change mindsets and the way we work for centuries um, in, a, in a, you know, doing it fast again. It's like kind of, that doesn't make sense. And we, we talked about, I'll just close with this. We talked about a lot in greater than about, we're not doing the, the future of work or, you know, whatever we want to create. If we ourselves as a team are exhausted, don't have any capacity for anything else. We are just kind of, some people close to burnout. I'm like, I keep seeing it and questioning, what are we doing? You know, we are talking about these, these things, but we're not bringing well-being as the essential baseline where we can work from and build, build from. Um, I think, yeah, I think I've opened up a few doors there as well. <laughs> My, my suggestion here is that we just walk the talk and take a, a moment to just take a breath together with the belly, please. And I don't know if Rich, you want to riff on this? Sure. Um, I, I notice I'm doing the thing that I often do, which is just to stand up for the um, the other poles in the room that haven't haven't had much appreciation. So I want to I want to appreciate development from the brain, the cognitive side of things, and I want to appreciate the 
the going fastness, the urgency. Uh, like the, the, I do believe the conditions of urgency are creating more and more energy. Um, and yeah, we have to slow down to, to access the kind of deep change that's necessary, but um, more people are going to be more willing to slow down as the urgency dials up the pressure. So it's a, it's, they're both assets for us. On the cognitive side, um, yeah, it was really nice actually just listen to James for a second. He, he speaks in a way, it, it feels familiar. It feels like a cousin, like you said, from a different social fabric. Um, it's, it, 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 you talk a bit the way that I talk. Um, and you've got different mental models. And, and I, I do want to hold up a candle for some mental models for a second. Um, that yes, we need to in, in, integrate and embody these things, but the, the symbols actually do give us some signposts. Um, so for example, you talked about coherence and I've just got my own allergy to that word. It's, it's not important. It's just my own you know, local thing is I come from an engineering background and coherence is a, it's a term from physics. And it's like, if you want to turn a light bulb into a laser, you get it coherent. And coherent means the same frequency, the same, uh, everything is exactly the same, the same phase. It's like everything is completely unified and you, you remove all difference and then you get a laser beam. So that's the picture I have in my head when you say coherence. I'm like, oh, it's not for me. And on the other hand, I'm a musician. So I'm very excited about harmony. I hate drum circles, by the way. But harmony uh, for me is about uh, different things coming together in relationship to each other and creating something bigger than the sum of the parts, right? So, so, but when I say harmony, other people are having this very washed out, neutralized, placid, you know, no action kind of thing. So it's the wrong mental model for them. For me, it's like, ah, oh, this is precisely, you know, like <laughs> mind blowing. And it's just, it doesn't, it just doesn't translate. And so the point I'm getting at here is, um, one of the blind spots is this attempt to download other people's mental models into your own context and say like, oh, if I just, it's the cargo cult, right? It's like, if I just reproduce these steps that I read in the book or I saw on TV or I heard from that smart podcast or something, then maybe I'll find my way, but there's, and, and I'm sure that helps to some degree, but there's a, there's a crucial step of local production of knowledge. Like the process of me figuring out why I'm so excited about this metaphor of harmony and doing that in my local groups and working out like, oh, there's a difference between, you know, we can have difference in relationship, which is harmony, or we can have difference out of relationship, which is chaos and conflict. And figuring out that out together, that was the, the crucial thing. But that word harmony, it's like, okay, well, you can take it or leave it. Um, yeah, I might have a few points there. Um, I see like kind of a correlation between power, vulnerability, uh, leadership, followership, accelerate, slow down, scale up, go deep. For me, all those elements kind of um, converge into one thing, which is uh, the feminine and, and the masculine. And um, I think that if we wanna reinvent uh, 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 a new culture and a new system, it first needs to be embodied in our organizations. So maybe I'm going a bit off track here, but this is kind of the, the, the frame I, I see. And, and I think that if we can truly um, uh, reinvent or uh, create a theory of sexual differences that uh, embodies both the masculine and the feminine and, and, and applying it in, within our organizations, um, this can be very, very powerful. Hmm. Interesting theme. Out. Every time I think about masculine and feminine, I think about qualities more than gender. And for me, kind of we all, um, woman or man or non-binary, doesn't matter. We all have masculine and feminine qualities and collectively as well. And I think that's also, I don't know, that balance between a structure and freedom and things like that, all those paradoxes, I think they all convert into that concept of the masculine and the feminine um, and how can we balance it individually in ourselves and collectively in groups or organizations I think even more in decentralized organizations because sometimes you know that's another of the myths that decentralized organizations have no structure and, and sometimes there is more structure than in a hierarchical organization it's just different but 
um, that idea of, yeah, just having complete freedom and chaos is just kind of like, that's also what I guess some people feel a little bit resistant to. And I think if we kind of have bring that lens of balancing the masculine and the feminine in what we do and how we work. Um, yeah, I don't have a magic formula for that. <laughs> And I think there's way too much work to do both at an individual and collective, um, yeah, kind of level. But um, yeah, I find it interesting. And for me, that is actually potentially the source of that harmony and all that coherence that Rich and James were talking about. And back to the drum circle metaphor, that's kind of the balance between the beat and the freedom of the others. Um, so somehow, yeah, I don't know how to get there or how we will get there or if anyone needs to get there. But for me, that's kind of where I personally want to see more of. Okay, um, I'll jump in. I think it's a, it's a really juicy hot topic once we start talking about the masculine and feminine. Um, I felt a little contraction in my belly around that. And I don't think that's for me personally, but it's around kind of get diving into this topic more in a public sphere because there's so much polarization and confusion, I would say, happening in the world today around some of these topics. I did want to push back on something you were sharing, Timothy, about it all coming down. I, I'm paraphrasing and maybe I misunderstood, but I see masculine and feminine, they're a polarity that the qualities of which are both resonant within all of us. And so I might be gender male, but with a more feminine center of balance, or I might be gender female with a more masculine center of balance and vice versa. But I would, I'm hesitant to kind of ballpark everything into the masculine and feminine, for example, doing and being, you know, it's like the feminine achieves amazing things and impacts the world in ways that are just profound and deep. And so can the masculine too, you know, so um, was it Bianca mentioned in the chat just now about the yin and the yang, and you've got the yin in the yang and the yang in the yin as well. But recognizing polarity and how polarity plays out in us, you know, we're a bundle of ir apparently irreconcilable opposites in conflict with ourselves. And until we get beyond that kind of binary worldview to embrace a more triune state of consciousness where we're recognizing our tendency to project those qualities of ourselves we're uncomfortable with for whatever reason onto others and reintegrate them for ourselves. And we're going to remain kind of locked into that polarized world. And this, I think, is quite crucial when it comes to getting into bed with a few other people or a few thousand or tens of thousands of people in some kind of organizational context, because the odds are that we've all learned to behave in quite different ways to survive our childhoods and arrive somewhat unscathed or at least convincingly sane in the world of adulthood. And very sometimes when vulnerable, we're going to polarize precisely down that line, you know, where one mirrors back exactly the behavior we learn not to express and, and vice versa. So um, masculine and feminine, really important. And certainly we live in a culture here in our our culture here in Europe for, Europe, for example, that's been heavily influenced by the masculine uh, and bringing more of the feminine quality, I think, is essential. Um, but the wider conversation here is around how we polarize regardless of gender, you know, down all kinds of ideological lines and opening to the possibility of expanding ourselves towards a more integrative approach towards our own uh, path towards greater wholeness and with each other as well because I suspect then you talk about harmony Richard and it's like to to be able to allow all voices in the choir to sing and to have access to the full diversity full spectrum of different perspective skills understanding and experience will help any organization to be as resilient and robust and regenerative even as it can be but once we're polarized and that energy goes into that judgment, into that endeavor to move away from and separate and really stands in the way of there being any development and growth at all. Thanks, James. Um, I just want to maybe briefly reconnect the, the topic of the masculine and the feminine with uh, dynamic leadership. For me, masculine is about stepping in, taking leadership, while feminine is the capacity of stepping back. It might be a bit simplistic as a view, and it's only mine. I'm not imposing on it on anyone. Um, but as a 
my personal experience is that um, my capacity to step in quite uh, is connected to, to my masculine energy, and um, and and so I think the question about coherence and dynamic leadership really lies into how can we support each other into developing this capacity to step in or to step back at uh, the right time in the right context. And maybe Fran, you have some thoughts about that. Yeah, I guess I've sort of been mulling on this question of um, organizations as like an actual, I guess, sort of frame of reference that we're talking about here. Um, because I think when we talk about, you know, coherence or harmony and all these different elements, I do find it helpful to differentiate, like, are we talking about society? Are we talking about, uh, like, my neighborhood, like, maybe sort of a, a broader social context that I'm in? Or are we talking about um, an organization or, like, a group that has a certain purpose of what it's trying to achieve? Um, because I think that coherence or harmony, whatever we want to call it, is quite different um, if we have a shared objective, no matter how like broad or, or tight it is. Um, but I guess to me, it really feels like this is a real uh, challenge actually that we've been wrangling with in different forms. Uh, if I think about like a community like WeShare that has an extremely broad purpose and that doesn't even have a defined edge, right? So it's sort of very porous, so it's, like been extremely hard to figure out like what is the minimum viable coherence that is needed and where what, what is the, the highly productive diversity and differences that we want to have because I think uh, somehow over time in many of these types of networks that I'm in what sort of happens is that it gets broader and broader and that because you sort of want to incorporate many things it actually becomes super hard to really have um, yeah I guess do big things together to, to say it in a very simplistic way. So yeah, to me that just feels really unresolved or that like we need to somehow get a better understanding of what types of coherence are, are, are what we're looking for in different contexts and what is too much um, and, and what are sort of the criteria that will actually make someone fit or not fit uh, into, into a certain context. And I guess to sort of bring it to a completely different example, um, some of the companies that we work with, like a common question that always comes up around uh, being self-organizing is like, how do we hire? How do we fire? Right. And that's about the boundary, right? People entering and leaving. And so when you sort of, I guess, flip on its head, the basic uh, ways that an organization functions, that question becomes quite fundamental and it's less clear. Like, is it because they're not doing a good job and because one person can sort of decide that they're gonna get fired or is it because they don't fit with the culture or they don't share the values? So yeah, um, it's still a bit raw, this thinking, but it feels uh, like an important differentiation. And I don't know if anyone has any thoughts <laughs> building on that. I, I have a puzzle to go with it. So maybe I can add that and someone else will fix it for us, friend. Um, I've noticed in some of the, I've been doing a little bit more like consulting lately, like going into other people's groups and trying to help them get into a higher state of function. And occasionally it's really obvious that like there's a person that just needs to leave. It's just like, it's just so, it's like, if you want to be doing this decentralized organization, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know, you have to be up for some degree of interior curiosity. You have to be curious about your own internal experience. You have to be willing to, um, look at what triggers strong emotions in you and be able to distinguish that like, oh, this is a boundary meaning I need to leave to be safe from, oh, this discomfort is telling me I've got something to learn here, I've got something to grow. You know, you've got to learn how to do that. That's a big part of the job. Um, and if you're not willing to do that, if you're, if you're always just projecting outwards and saying every time I feel some negative emotion, the problem is out there and something needs to change out there, you're just going to have an awful time in these kind of organizations. Like it's not going to work and everyone's going to have an awful time working with you. Um, so sometimes I come in to a group and I've got one in mind right now, where it's just like, you have to work on yourself or go away. <laughs> like if we want this group to work, like this, it's just so obvious. That it's like this um, brick wall in the flow of the group. Um, and on what authority do I make that claim? And even if it's true, uh, so what do we do about it? <laughs> How do we react to that with, with 
compassion and grace and fairness and you know i don't know i also just want to note looking at the time that uh encourage people to share your questions in the chat um because we want to start bringing in some of the yeah the questions that you might be having that are coming up as we keep discussing and also if you want to um yeah share live your question um you can also raise your hand but i'll i'll let you all continue with that prompt and i'm also aware james that i think you have to leave fairly soon so maybe you want to take the opportunity yeah yeah i need to jump off in five minutes or so um i was interviewing someone a couple of days ago who've been pulling in a number of patents from S3 into their organization since they founded it four years ago. We met recently. I didn't know that they've been doing that, but it was a great story. We're going to share that on the, on the online learning community soon. Um, but one topic we dove into there was around selection. You know, and they have an extremely rigorous recruitment process. Um, and the first interview they do is the cultural interview. Um, and there's a number of steps to that. So it's really checking for cultural fit first and then technological fit second. And um, he was saying that in the last month, they interviewed 100 people, I think. Um, and of that, they've chosen three to come into the organization. And statistically, he said, interestingly, about 50% of people seem to fit the criteria for cultural fit. And then they fell down on the technical side. But I guess the point there, most of the people who applied were a technical fit. Um, so I'm not saying they're generic statistics we can rely on in all cases, but it definitely demonstrates that one out of two may be not a good fit for you in terms of just the cultural side alone. And I think that can be a bit difficult sometimes to make that call and to say thanks, but no thanks, or even to know what it is that you're looking for to start with, especially in the early days, because, you know, it, culture takes a while to reveal itself somehow, you know, and to see those inherent values that can't help but express themselves through the, the, uh, the song you all end up singing together. Um, but uh, it's much easier to kind of say thanks, but no thanks at that point um, than as you were suggesting, like to, to ask people to leave later somehow. Um, so that's one, just one thought that comes to mind for me. And I think it's often under appreciated especially by people without having undergone the sometimes very difficult experience of dealing with somebody who's now uh, kind of well embedded into a system and and sometimes even the legal challenges of being able to ask someone to go if not the ethical challenges as well um, so I thought that was a valuable point that he made and with that, I think that will be my last verbal contribution. I'm going to hang on just a few more moments to listen in while I can, and then, then I need to leave. But I wish you all enjoy a really nourishing and insightful rest of the call. Thank Thanks, you. James. Thanks so much, James. Um, I, I, sorry, you got in. Uh, yeah. No, you go for it, Lucia. I was just going to share an example of something that a company called Fever Click uh, do in terms of letting people go. Um, they do have a very open decentralized culture. And I don't remember the details, but after a number of, when someone joins, they give people a number of months. I don't remember if it was three or six to decide whether they want to stay or not, along with the company deciding whether they want them to stay or not. But, um, and then if someone decides to not stay, they actually give them another three or six months of their salary and help them find another job. So I think what they, what they actually do is make it easier because in those circumstances, when it's so clear, um, Rich, you were saying, sometimes it's so clear one person has to leave. Chances are that person is struggling and suffering as well, and they don't wanna be there either. <laughs> So kind of establishing and implementing mechanisms that allow for that person to actually live in a way that is not traumatic or, you know, difficult. And I guess sometimes people decide not to live because they need that salary and kind of is like a chicken and egg thing. So finding mechanisms to allow people to live 
if it's not the right fit. Um, something like that. Uh, David Tomas, who is the non CEO of Feverclick, was sharing this practice with us. And, and yeah, like I said, I don't remember the details, but it was really about making it, making the exit process easy for everyone and possible for everyone. And he said, no one has taken it so far, but if someone decides to take it, they will totally do that that way. Um, yeah, I don't know if that solves the problem, <laughs> but, but there are ways happening out there in some and some organizations kind of playing with how to make that easier. On this topic of, uh, of boundaries, like the struggle between um, uh, not traumatizing the person with whom we are setting the boundary and actually respecting kind of the needs of the organization. Um, for me, this really connects with uh, the paradox of inclusivity where um, the cost of integrating a person that is not aligned with um, the values and the purpose of the organization actually leads to the people that are already aligned to step back themselves. So it's kind of ex excluding the aligned elements um, uh, when by, by wanting to be inclusive. And for me, this kind of integrate with, uh, resonate with the notion of conflict avoidance and uh, how, um, yeah, it's so hard just to set boundaries because we're just so afraid of hurting the other. I mean, I am, I'm going to talk with an eye here. Um, but the result is that I'm, I'm actually uh, putting violence against myself every time I'm uh, repressing maybe anger inside of me. And this, in the end, on the long run, can lead to much more violence. So, yeah, I think this, this notion of uh, setting boundaries uh, to create actually um, intimacy and, and, and care is, is truly essential in uh, centralized organizations. Yeah, I think it would be great to also um, dive a bit into a question here that Antje brought um, in the chat about uh, our whole self, bringing our whole self, which we also talked about last week, um, this week. Um, so she was asking about, yeah, what does it require to bring your whole self, um, being aware of blind spots, traumas? Um, that's a bit the question. I don't know if Antje wants to say anything else about the question. You're welcome to do that, or otherwise we'll we'll jump in and respond. Anyone want to share some thoughts on that? Maybe just before this, uh, I, I'm suggesting just to take like maybe 30 seconds or one minute so that we reconnect with our bodies and maybe try to identify <sighs> what are the emotions uh, present uh, in us right now. Maybe what, what are you sensing um, about this conversation? And now we can open the, the Q&A, uh, leave it to you, Fran. Mm. Rafia, Rich, any of you feel like jumping in on this whole self question? I mean, yeah, I always, I'm always ready to speak, so I'll give Lithia the turn. Um, I have so many questions around this topic. Um, to start with, what does that even mean? What does bring your whole self to work mean? Um, and is it healthy? Is it necessary? And is it healthy even for the person or for the team? And I think sometimes it actually, it doesn't mean just dump everything that I have in myself onto the team or to the group or onto another person. Sometimes it's about being able to say, actually, I don't feel like sharing that. Uh, you know, it's just fine as well. I think we move, we were talking about polarities as well before, and we move from nothing to all. And I think there's, you know, there's that kind of level of awareness and the capacity to ask questions and to sit with the questions sometimes is more important than sharing everything and anything. And yeah, like I said, I think I have way many more questions about how that concept of bringing yourself to work, your whole self to work, is used or understood even. 
these days. And I think there's probably many, many, many different understandings of what that means. Um, so I guess, yeah, that could be a conversation to have, you know, mm -hmm. with yourself or with your team. What do we mean? Do we want to do this? And what does it mean? And how does it look like? And where is the boundary as well? And can I say to you sometimes, sorry, I don't want to hear that right now, <laughs> you know? Because sometimes it's the other way around. Maybe you're just dumping stuff and I'm the one who's like, I'm not ready or I don't want to hear that or I don't want to hear it now. And I think we have to have that. For me, that's more what bringing your whole self to work means. Being able to have that honesty and sometimes setting boundaries feels like a negative thing, but I think it's really, really healthy for yourself and for the, dynam the group dynamic. Hmm. For me, it's um, bringing your whole self to work. It's just a brand, you know, it's just, it's just a signpost. Um, it's not an actual instruction. Like it's, it's a sign of emotional maturity to have different selves in different contexts. Like I'm different with my partner in our bedroom than I am with my cousin or in the boardroom like that. That's not a problem. <laughs> I, but I think it's like, what is that signpost pointing at? I think it's pointing at all the ways that people have felt excluded at work. And so what what parts have been excluded in the past and are there some of those that i'd like to bring in um that question might generate some some useful instructions more so than just the, the sort of catch-all brand it's kind of, i think it's similar to lots of the stuff in the space of like non-hierarchical organizing it's like well maybe hierarchy is not precisely the the issue but it's a good enough point to tell, tell us which direction to go in. yeah i think it really gets uh, misunderstood a lot is my impression with that phrase. And I think back sometimes to a couple years ago when we share when a lot of people had very strong emotional reactions to that. And I think that I've at least observed in myself really how that sort of concept has really become a lot more nuanced and like contextual, right? And that it's almost about like having options of what you can bring when. And I think I always uh, remember when Frédéric Lelou talks about the concept um, he always shows like a photo of a person and then basically like covers everything except for like a little eye or a little quarter and says, this is all that you're allowed to bring to the regular workplace and everything else is covered up, right? So I think it's almost like having the ability to choose and to sort of, yeah, um, have, I guess, the, the freedom to bring what is uh, what you want to bring in, in a given moment and what feels authentic. Um, and I think authenticity is obviously something that's also very uh, hard to identify what that is. Um, you sort of just know you're being authentic, I guess, by how you're feeling. But yeah, I think that we do need to be careful with um, sort of taking it too, uh, too seriously and like misinterpreting it. I've seen that in some groups of like thinking that just means you have to bring all of your emotions all the time and it just becomes too heavy for the group. Like you can't, you can't carry it. Um, and so I think we have a bunch of other questions um, here in the chat coming through. So, um, well, one that I'm wondering if anyone here has maybe some tips or experience is how to convince um, or like basically sell this idea of uh, decentralized organizing in public institutions. <laughs> I don't know if anyone here has had some experience with that or has any advice. I've had experience of outright failure um, <laughs> That's always and, most interesting. and now I've tried to quit convincing people and I just work with the people that are already convinced and support them on their path. Yeah, I think, yeah, I'm similar to that. If I had to do anything in some way, like in, in an institution like that, and it's not only, um, yeah, public institutions, it's sometimes corporations as well. I would really start with small teams with a team that is already aligned with all this and that we're introducing practices could be possible and yeah but i think like rich i personally have a little bit of a an allergy to working trying to convince anyone i don't think it's worth it and i don't think it's needed really and this is not the way for everyone either or for every organization so it's fine and in some cases they you know just needs to stay things just needs to stay as they are and not trying to change everything and everyone i think it's quite humbling as well and healthy for everyone 
I think, I think there are maybe... some people, there are some people with that role of convincing as well. I want to honor them as well. I'm just thinking about K2K, for example. They do a really great job. They do they sort of transform organizations from traditional to worker directed. And they do a great job of really building the logical case and saying, this is why, this is why, and 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 be, being run by the numbers and the efficiency of it. So it is possible. It's just not, I'm not good at it. Yeah, I think in many cases it's actually not convincing, but finding allies in the organization and right, those people that are like on the tipping point. We often talk about like people that have sort of seen like, okay, this isn't working, we need something else, but maybe they're really just at that moment of like, I don't know what could be different. And then usually there's a lot of openness there to then introduce something new. But yeah, I think that unfortunately, I, I definitely am also in the camp of disillusioned a little, because what I've often seen is that when you do find those allies that really believe in it, that they end up just leaving the organization at some point um, as they progress in their journey, which, you know, maybe is totally fine as well. Um, and, and then you can just support those individuals. Um, but yeah, I think it's important to work with a positive energy, for my opinion. So like rather than uh, trying to sort of maybe suppress something happening to more uplift uh, certain, yeah, people taking initiative, people wanting to, to experiment. And so that could be inside a big institution. Um, it could be in any type of team. Um, yeah. And there are people there hiding in the middle of all these big organizations. There's so many people doing things differently, but they might not have the language. They might not know that they are doing or kind of practicing these, these different ways of working, um, but they're, they're out there, yeah. I just, so want, another... I just want to propose regarding this, like uh, focusing on the positive, what would be uh, maybe the positive uh, aspects of decentralized organizing? What are the, the positive blind spots that we mm. fail to recognize uh, within our, our movement? Well, um, I, the way I think about it is any mode of organizing has trade-offs and shortcomings. Um, so in a traditional hierarchy, the shortcomings might be a really toxic workplace culture and a lot of coercion and abuse. Um, and in a decentralized organization, the trade-off might be it's really inefficient and you're always talking about your feelings. Um, and I just feel like from my experience of both halves, I prefer the negative consequences of the decentralized mode because it feels like I'm growing as a person, I'm becoming a better partner, a better friend. Um, even if sometimes I'm not particularly good at delivering on the task that was assigned to me. The, the, the negative side effects seem to be more wholesome from the decentralized mode than my experience. Hmm. I love that. Yeah, that's a beautiful question, Tim. And I think, yeah, um, I was saying I'm a bit biased towards personal and collective growth. Uh, and, and so I think that's one of the positive blind spots of decentralized movements and organizations that we actually put us in the spot to grow collectively. And, and the ripple effect of that, the personal and individual growth in these spaces and in the team and collectively, and hopefully, you know, in humanity, it's um, something that I hold on to. Mm -hmm. So there's an interesting question here from Lori Palano about any techniques to surface collective blind spots. I'm curious maybe also, cause like Tim, maybe you could say a little bit about that, uh, that thing we did in WeShare about surfacing some shadows. That was a pretty interesting process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So how can we actually celebrate everything that um, we are doing, which is aligned with our values? So within WeShare, it's about openness, care, collaboration, democracy, and help me, Fran, the last one. Permanent beta? <laughs> Permanent beta, exactly. So we actually did a process of for each value. Look, what are, we, what are the actions, the concrete actions that we're doing that are aligned with those mm -hmm. values? Um, and then go into the more misaligned practices. Um, and I think that if it's done in a, a skillful way, naturally there's a, a, a realignment that can emerge uh, out of this process but it kind of needs um, I think 
uh, enough psychological safety and enough care and also not going too deep too fast. I think it's a lot about uh, aiming for the low hanging fruits and not going for the very deep and very dark, but like building up step by step. Um, I think that, yeah, if you can have this approach, then uh, you are on the path of realigning yourself and integrating uh, some of your shadows in a collective way, because the, the, the interest of this practice is that some others uh, from the group might perceive shadow practices that you're not. And doing this thing all together actually also helps you on the individual level to realize maybe some practices that you're doing and some behavior that you're actually unconscious about. So yeah, this is uh, one, one approach. I wanted to jump on that one too. I, I love collecting practices. Um, as you said, Tim, sometimes that approach can that one of the risks of that is going too deep too fast and like uncovering a whole bunch of trauma and pain that you don't really have the capacity to hold. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of the work that we do is just very uh, well-scoped, small, regular reflection processes. So people have a, a, a frequent opportunity to talk about what's not working so well. And so that you get to hear that you get this little tension release uh, every couple of weeks rather than allowing it to build up into this massive process. Um, there's two others I wanted to mention. One is the practice I actually learned from someone from Poker Lab. So you may already know it, Laurie, but it's uh, the trigger log. So that for me, that means like when I get triggered, I go to my diary and I really unpack everything. What's the story here? How does it feel? How intense is it? What are my needs? What were Chris? Like just really get curious about my own experience of that emotional trigger. And when you have a practice of that happening in the group, um, that opens up all kinds of amazing conversations and helps people take responsibility for their own experience. Um, and their boundaries and so on. And then the other one that's been helpful for me is various kinds of polarity mapping. So um, if we have this tension between being and doing, well, let's put that on the board and say, what would it be like if we did 100% being and we didn't do any doing at all? And what are the pros and cons of that? And then flip to the other side and really attend to all of the quadrants of the polarity and um, name that this, these tensions exist. People, I mean, the thing with blind spots is, um, Often they're like the elephant in the room that everyone kind of knows is there, but hasn't been hasn't been given permission to talk about. So finding ways to create that permission, and then suddenly all the intelligence is already there. Yeah, one other thing that comes to mind, which isn't really a practice, but um, basically really uh, like you making use of the opportunity when people uh, join and leave the organization to really uh, like listen to them. Because I find when someone joins really fresh, like there's sort of like a window of like a few months when they have this like beautiful external perspective where they're sort of coming in and they're starting to see things. And I find that like, if you make space for them to really share what they're seeing, uh, you can really find a lot of interesting things. One, one thing that comes to mind when we talk about all these things that are going a little bit deeper and it's, the concept of optionality. I don't even know if that's a word, but I guess all these things should be optional because otherwise we create this stress and this sense of lack of safety if I have to share, but if I'm not ready. And even if we do in a circle, I think it's so important to just give people the option to say, pass. <laughs> um, otherwise we are kind of re-traumatizing and creating another level of blind spots at the end of the day. <laughs> Yeah, it's an, a, a whole art that you actually need to master for yourself first if you want to drive a group. And I think there's a, a lot of room for uh, improvement there for many people, including me. I can see that Bianca Yin has raised her hand. Do you want to jump in with a, a, one of our last questions? Yes, um, that would be lovely. So <laughs> um, my question would be, probably also be quite appropriate as a last question because um, it's half part question and half part actually um, I, I feel a desire to kind of um, ask for some help and really trying to um, distill some of the key takeaways from today because like from where I am um, like and the question part is also related to that um, I found it incredibly interesting listening to you guys like um, talk about like these different topics because I can tell that you are all actually practicing 
and really um, on this path of exploring what it means to build like decentralized organizations. But then on the other hand, because I haven't really been, um, so I was born in Europe and I lived large parts of my life there. But the last about like f five to seven years, I've actually been more here in China, in Asia. And so just listening to you guys, I find it really interesting because like I somehow have this like intuitive feeling that even though maybe like people over here in Asia and like you guys in maybe Europe, uh, in the more Western part of the world, like we are kind of working towards like a similar goal, right? Like like the comment that I shared about integrating the yin and the yang. But then I also have this like really intuitive feeling that we are going about it in some slightly different ways or, or slightly different angles. So, um, so, so the first part in terms of seeking for support is love to hear um, like what, what you like, because the topic was like the blind spots of like building decentralized organizations, right? So I would love to hear like what you guys feel like are some of your biggest takeaways from today's discussion, like because I heard different topics come up such as leadership and cultural fit and um, boundaries and such. And it wasn't very easy for me to grasp. So, so that's the first part of the question. And the second part is, um, because like I'm in a kind of same but different sphere, I'm super curious like where you guys see yourself if you like imaginarily stepped outside of like where you guys all are right now, like um, like it, like even if you just imagine like you were actually me, you know, like here in, in Asia working on decentralized organizations and like where do you feel like you guys are in this journey of exploring this, um, and and more importantly, where do you see this journey going next? So that would be the question part. Thank you, Bianca. Um, so we are actually out of time right now. Um, before we're gonna jump into breakouts, the new invitation here is to actually take the question of Bianca and to maybe discuss it in small groups about what were the main takeaways from the session uh, for you. Um, and unfortunately, I think we won't have time to address the second part of your question. Um, but, but yeah, what I'm maybe going to add to that, Tim, is my suggestion is that basically we, the speakers, we're going to stay here while you go into breakouts to, to share what your insights, what you're all taking away. And we'll also try to maybe do some synthesizing of where we're coming at so that when we all come back together at the end, we can share a little bit as well. So hopefully that will give you some answers. And I just want to prompt uh, a last thing before we jump into the breakouts about We Share Fest, uh, that we will have a session on collaborative culture and someone called Peter Conning. Peter Conning has created a concept called the source, which maybe allows to reconstruct healthy hierarchies. And uh, we'll have plenty of other uh, great workshops and speakers. I invite you to check the website uh, and uh, to join us in two weeks in Paris. So now we can join us, we can join uh, the breakouts, I think. <laughs> yeah, I did a typo there on that link. But so I hope that some of you are going to stay around um, for just another 25 minutes. So we're going to put you into small groups now to do some digesting and discussing of everything you've been hearing. Um, and then we'll all be back in probably, yeah, I think we'll give you like 17 minutes so that we have just a bit of time to share back all together. So I'm gonna open the rooms now and see you back very soon. Welcome back everyone. Um, so we're moving uh, to the final phase of this session. I hope you had a good time in the breakout room and I would love to hear a bit, uh, some feedbacks from what happened there. So if you wouldn't like to just unmute yourself. Yeah, if anyone wants to just share any, any snippets, insights, interesting um, key takeaways, we can just free flow for a few minutes since we're a little more intimate group now. And feel free to turn on your video also.
Everyone's very shy. Luthia, I'm, sure. I'm wondering if you want to kick off with that one key takeaway that you were sharing earlier. Yeah, sure. Um, it would be great to hear, to hear other people as well. But um, we were having a little chat as well while you were in the breakout rooms. And I was thinking about what are my key takeaways? What is my key takeaway? Because there's been so many things in the conversation. And actually, for me, I think it comes down to the importance of having these conversations. And it doesn't matter. It's not about the content. It's about you know, creating the spaces for having these conversations, whether in your own little context or openly, publicly, like this one. But that that is for me with the beauty and the healing and the power of relationship is. And Rich was also saying before he had to leave, and I totally resonate with it. I personally grow in relationship, and I think better in relationship. I'm way more creative in relationship. And having conversations for me, it's just um, it's just the takeaway in itself. Hmm. I'm wondering if uh, Valerie, you have some uh, insight. I'm sure you do. Speaking, speaking on people. <laughs> Yeah, well, we, 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 that was a really nice conversation. We, we, we asked ourselves uh, what, what we wanted to take away. I, what I resonated with was uh, power of vulnerability and also the notion of presenting and the, um, the incapacity that I see within myself and in most groups that uh, when we talk about theory of change or trying to uh, act differently in the world, we can't help uh, reproducing the same process, meaning uh, solving a problem, trying to find a solution. And I wonder that was mentioned too, is uh, the concentration rather than finding solution or growth, which is another uh, expression of patriarchy, you know, even if we put it in the spiritual realm, we're still talking about growth and transformation and going somewhere. So what if we could create some space where we just sink in the trouble, sink in the fear, sink in the shadows and really embracing the shadows and really realizing we are the shadows and from that let come the solution through us and not trying to find uh, find it um, uh, find it stop trying and more relaxing so kind of a space so that was mentioned so I will uh, and uh, yeah and uh, I was with Sting and um, and uh, po Paula um, and um, yeah we resonate and um, uh, yeah well I forgot already but uh, yeah thank you Valerie relaxing in the presence of the shadows I think it's beautiful is there anyone from the other group that would like to share a bit what happened there? Yeah, maybe Anne. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was with uh, Zach or Seth in one room. And uh, unexpectedly, we had a dive into DAOs, so the decentralized autonomous organizations, of which I do not know a lot, just a very little, little bit. Um, but it sparks my interest to know more about that. And uh, one thing that we noticed in this conversation was a huge, uh, on the conversation that we heard before, it was a huge emphasis on the internal work. So one of my questions was, is it like also needed in a DAO or is it just um, easier? But um, in his opinion, it's like always needed and hard to do. And we have been reflecting on that, on the importance of uh, the inner world and how it, inner work and also how important it is to, to address the problems in our world today, this type of organizing and doing this work. Thank you. Thanks. That's a, that's a really great question and definitely is a full session in itself about uh, yeah, the personal development work in the DAO context. Yeah, super interesting. So do we have time for one more share, Tim, or what are you thinking? 
Um, yeah, we have two minutes. If uh, anyone would like to do a last sharing. Yeah, what about Alice and Pedro's room? We haven't heard from you. I don't know if they're here. Alice and Pedro. Maybe not. Maybe not. Okay, so maybe we're just gonna close here. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining us today uh, for this little deep dive exploration. Uh, thank you so much, Fran, for organizing this uh, with me and greater than um, for being partner and also the tech team, uh, Romain, for all the support uh, and also Solène, uh, who's there, the WeShare team. So um, a last invitation, uh, WeShare Fest in Paris, 23, 25th. Uh, we'll have uh, amazing workshops and speakers. Uh, I think, did I already say that? Warm data lab, work that reconnects, uh, collective presencing. Uh, we'll have a money game, we'll have Presencing Institute with Theory U, uh, we'll have XR, we'll get, have Fridays for Future, we will have Transition Town, uh, boom, 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 we have a DJ vinyl, a vinyl set DJ, so you better be there in Bobigny in Paris in two weeks. Um, Thanks amazing. everybody. Thanks Tim so much um, for initiating this and yeah, hope to see you all again in some other setting virtual or in person. Thank you so much, both of you and everyone. Thank Bye, you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank that you. That was very cool.